Hello, everybody. We'll uh, just leave a minute or so so everybody can settle in and join us on this uh, little colder day today, but hopefully everybody enjoyed some of the sunshine this weekend. So we have myself, Eric, we have Pear, and our special guest today, Sean Senge from uh, Fidelity Investments, who we'll, uh, we'll get to very uh, shortly, but very excited to have Sean uh, share his perspective today, share what he's hearing on the internal side, on the market side, and on the investment side of things. And I thought it would be a topical time now that we're almost through tax season and a subtle reminder there if anybody is still lagging behind on that reminder to get your uh, your tax documents in so you can get that filed and done before April 30th. And then uh, you can enjoy the warmer weather that hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be blessed with in May. So I'll just uh, grab a look here, see how we're doing. Hello, Chuck. Hi, Craig. Hi, Dave. Hi, David. Hello, Michael. Hello, Paula. Hi, Samantha. Hello, Suzanne. And hi, Vince. Thank you for joining us today. We've got a few more that are coming in, but uh, we'll be punctual. So uh, without further ado, very happy to introduce Sean Sege. Uh, today, we wanted to do a bit of an investment outlook. It's been an interesting time, to say the least, in uh, the markets, at least the last going back to 2021. Uh, so uh, the goal today is is to to tease out some questions uh, here. If you have anything that, that you'd like to share, anything that you'd like answered, and uh, we'll hear from Sean to see what the uh, one the fidelity perspective is, what some uh, what he's hearing from some of the managers, and uh, what uh, positioning uh, we're we're looking at in terms of uh, managed portfolios. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Sean, and uh, very happy to uh, to welcome you here today, Sean. Great Just game. Just a quick reminder as well, uh, this webinar works better with questions, so please put your questions in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll make sure to ask them as we go along. Sorry, Sean. Well, th thanks for having me, gang. Um, always a pleasure to be part of this group. I think it's been maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 months since I've been on with everybody. And Eric, as a reminder, if you just let me share my screen, I can uh, use as a basis for discussion in a little bit. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so where are we at? So let's take, it always helps to look backwards a little bit, gang. And last year, undoubtedly, in my almost 20-year career in the business was the toughest investment year. Uh, there's Jeff. Good to see you. Um, so why was it so tough? And We've had bad equity years. We rarely in an, our investment time have seen tough fixed income years. And what this slide is showing is, and I always say to clients, did last year feel tough or to investors, did last year feel tough? Well, it should have. Because if you look um, on this slide, you know, in a perfect world, your returns are out here, right? In a perfect world, because you've got bond returns are pretty good. You got equity returns are pretty good. So in a perfect world, you're up here. You can see where we were last year, arguably the toughest environment ever. So how do we end up in that spot just to take a look back because it helps to know what we're looking at going forward. Well, the, the Fed and central banks around the world were hyper aggressive in rising rates. Why did they do that? Well, if you look at the last 15 or 20 years, uh, anytime there was an issue with the equity markets, a couple of things happened. Central governments, or sorry, a government stimulated and central banks ease monetary policy. And we'd have a great kind of bounce back in the equity markets and everything worked great. Now that got even more. Uh, so we had cheap money for a long time because rates were getting lower. Now this you know, low interest rate environment, even worse during the pandemic. Tons of spending programs, tons of stimulus, and really low rates. And what happened is central banks around the world thought they had everything fixed, but we started to have inflation hit. And inflation becomes a societal issue. When people can't afford, you know, basic necessities of life, you've got to tackle inflation very, very quickly. So central banks around the world, Bank of Canada, Fed, you name it around the world, raise rates quickly. And we saw what that what happens to both stock and bond markets. The crazy thing is people think, you know, some people think we had a recession last year. We did not have a recession last year. OK, that's something we might look at going forward. But we did not have a recession. But when you rapidly rise rates, you have to discount future earnings 
on stocks and we saw what it did to the bond market. So if you felt like last year was a challenging year for you as an investor, it should have been because as you can see in the lower left there, it was. But why do we invest? So if you look, and for those of you that have heard me speak before, you know, the reason why we invest is pretty simple. You know, 70% of the, every, every uh, rectangle here for the rec, uh, just, just for clarity, every uh, rectangle I call it a brick, every brick in the wall is a calendar year in the markets, okay? So why do we invest? 70% of the years, markets are up. 30% of the years, markets are down. You know, if you, if you do the old bell curve, your average market year here is about nine or 10%. You know, if we were 50-50, 50% of the years, markets were up, 50% of the years, markets were down, and our average return was 0%, we wouldn't invest. But over time, our numbers are with us. Last year in the US market, we we're down not quite 20% in US dollars, but almost. But that's just a reminder of, of why we um, why we're in the business, okay? And why you as investors, you invest to meet your goals. So what are we looking at going forward? Well, to explain this slide a bit, gang, this is our asset allocation team at Fidelity. So all of our top-down strategists, many of them form a bank of Canada, uh, employees, um, this is a way that they take the mix, the fidelity mix, and deliver it to you. What do I mean by that? Um, only because we're heading into the NHL playoffs, I'll use that as an example. You know, how many forwards do you want in the lineup? How many defensemen do you want in the lineup? Your forwards, your goal scorers would be seen as growth managers. Your defense would be seen as value managers. You know, typically equities are offense. Um, fixed income or bonds or defense. And if you look here, um, this is going off of a neutral 60-40 mix, which most people here, geez, pension funds are 60 equity, 40 fixed income. So where does that leave us off of, okay, if Fidelity has a standard 60-40 mix, where are we today? Okay, so many times on the equity side, will be at 65, 64% equities because long-term equities outperform. So many times this equity side shows we're overweight 5%. As you can see, see today, we're pretty neutral, right? We're very neutral. It's about market weight, overweight, not even 1%, okay? Because for the same reason that bonds were a challenging area to be in last year, they're fairly attractive this year. So bonds right now, the yield to worst on this side of the equation is about 7%. If we were having this discussion about a year ago, this number would have been less than three, okay? So it made last year a tough year, should make this year a, a little bit of a better year, okay? So the fixed income side uh, is looking a little better. We are worried that inflation is a little stickier than everybody thinks. What do we mean by that? Inflation by its nature is coming down because you, you, you compare year over year prices and prices this time last year were getting elevated. But the Bank of Canada and the Fed's goals have inflation around 2%. And that's a long way from where we are now. So kind of the easy lifting has been done. So we think if inflation is going to stick around a little bit, you want to be overweight commodities. We are. You want to own these types of bonds. And we do. So that gives a bit of a high level on what we're thinking from a market perspective. And then some people will ask me, which is fair game. They ask me about these two things. Boom, underweight the Canadian dollar relative to benchmark and underweight Canadian equities relative to benchmark. And I am a proud Canadian and I love living here. I think there's no better place on earth. But are in Canada, our consumer to or sorry, consumer debt to income ratio is at all time highs. Okay, it is at all time highs. In fact, if you look at 30 or, four, 30 or 40 countries in the developed world, we have one of the highest debt to income ratios in the world at about 180 percent. 
If you look back at the global financial crisis in 2007, the U.S. was about at 175. We're lower, but the U.S. did a big reset in 2007. So their um, their debt to income ratio is, is around 110 percent. We're at about 180 in Canada. So if rates go up and you have lots of debt, that really, really hurts the average individual. Okay, so that's why we're a little underweight Canadian equities. And then why are we underweight the Canadian dollar? Um, that Currencies are the most difficult call to make. That being said, the, the yield curve is currently inverted, which uh, you know it, is a bit of a technical explanation. But if I tell you what that means, eight of the last the last eight recessions have been preceded by an inverted yield curve. It might be a shallow recession, um, but it's a pretty good indicator. And if you have a recession, you can still make some money, right? You just have to invest properly. So if you have a recession, you want to be overweight bonds. So you want to be overweight bonds here plus, and the U S dollar typically does well in a recession. So you want to be underweight the Canadian dollar because people usually like a flight to safety in a recession. So people see the U S dollar as being a safe haven and they see bonds as being a safe haven. Um, so that is where we're at from a macro perspective um, here at Fidelity. Um, and then the other one underlying theme I would add in this slide here, and I always tell mar our marketing team we should have another uh, area over here is growth versus value managers. So if you look at the growth versus value story, you know, growth managers being tech, you know, invested in tech or biotech, where value managers might be invested in, you know, some, you know, very well priced securities, you know, growth being your, your offense value, your defense. And for when money was cheap, when rates were low, you wanted to be overweight growth. Now we see more of that in balance. So for example, last year, values when rates were going through the roof, value significantly outperformed. And we like a nice balance in there um, at current market level. So you'll see some of our best growth managers and some of our best value managers in, in these portfolios. So that gang, I gave you a little bit of an overview and you know, guys, I don't know if we have any questions out there. Um, yeah, I'll just stop here for a minute. Or if, you, if that generated any questions with you. Thanks, Sean. Um... So the first question here is, uh, what are the uh, potential risks uh, and opportunities that investors should be looking at for 2023? And how can they take advantage of that? That's what uh, we have one question coming in there. Good, good question. The biggest risk is, in, is the recession right now. Some people think it's priced in, right? Some people don't. So that would be, you know, and is it different in Canada versus the U.S.? So that would be, in our view, the biggest risk. Other risks are inflation, right? Does it stick around a little longer, right? Um, and then, like, I'm just kind of going from top down here. Another risk might be, you know, we think uh, earning estimates on the street might be a tad high right now. Um, that's not a huge risk. Uh, you know, we think banks, you know, what happened with SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, that, that was a bit of a, you know, it, it was more of a liquidity issue than a solvency issue. In fact, you know, there's no run on deposits throughout the world right now. So those are some of the risks. And I've kind of mentioned how we've positioned the portfolios to um, defend against those risks. But how you might, how might you take um, advantage of those, which is Five is second part to that question is, is staying liquid a little bit. So, um, you know, run the other way when somebody recommends a GIC because you're not liquid, right? Very rarely does a GIC outperform, right? So if I look here on my, if I look here, I got a couple of visuals here for people. 
Uh, GICs rarely outperform one-year Canadian bonds. Last year they did for the first time in a long time. Um, and then, uh, but five-year GICs have never outperformed, you know, uh, five-year trailing Canadian bonds. So GICs after a tough year sound very, very attractive. But, you know, if there is a pullback, you want to have some money ready to move. So it might be in a couple of different ways. It might be you bought a fund like our global balanced or maybe global income. Global balance is 60% equity. Maybe you buy global income, which is 40% equity and the market pulls back a bit. Maybe that's when you switch it to the 60% equity, global balanced, right? Um, maybe it's, Hey, I just, you know, um, just did my taxes and I have a $25,000 refund. Um, if that's happening to you, I'm very jealous. Um, but maybe you're taking that money and you're investing some today and you're leaving some powder dry or your dollar cost averaging that into the market over the next 12 months. So we diversify in our portfolios. You might also want to diversify your entry points, but I, you know, one of the worst air, you know, one of the worst investment vehicles, I think for the next 12 months would be a GIC because bonds are, you know, our bond outlook is very good, is very strong. And then secondly, um, if there is a pullback, right, you want to have some money liquid. Now, also, you know, you three gentlemen are investment advisors. I also say you have a tough uh, time with your clients on the on the call because you can say, let's keep some money liquid. But when the markets are down, is the toughest time to invest. But that's when, you know, when one of your advisors calls, you have to say, remember that conversation we had, right? Remember that conversation we had? How about we take advantage of this? You know, this, if I look at, um, let's see here. You know, this is a very, very difficult uh, emotional roller coaster we're in when it comes to investing. So it is very, very difficult to buy here. It is very difficult, but, you know, history shown that's when it pays off and that's why you want to stay liquid and that's why we all use advisors right because the advisor helps you getting from getting too greedy up here and advisor helps you stay away from despair when you're down here right i've been in the business a long time and i still you know sit with my colleagues and we talk about where we are on this cycle uh very very frequently where do you think we are now, Sean? I have a, I have a guess. Yeah, I, I you know at the at year end, uh, at calendar year end, I think we're kind of here, <laughs> um, somewhere in here. Now, uh, you know, the TSX year to date is up six percent. The S and P five hundred is up seven percent. The Barclays U.S. Ag which is a bond index is up three. So I think we're maybe, maybe we're up here, um, you know, and, and it's open for debate right now. Um, and I think usually the retail investor lags the advisor. So I think a lot of advisors, you know, who've been through this before are up here, but I think some investors might be stuck back here. I don't know if that answers your question Eric. That's about where I was going to say, I think, I mean, the sentiment that, that we get, especially after a tough year is, oh, okay, well, what, when have I made back uh, the value that's, that's declined? And the answer is, well, it's going to take time in the markets to get there. But I think we're dipping back into that positivity and that, and that optimism, uh, especially with the start of the year. I mean, we, we do keep hearing recessions that are coming up. So that uh, I would put us uh, one foot in the red camp, one foot in the green camp, but that would be the sentiment that I'm gathering from clients in our conversations. Uh, can I can I toss a word in here, you guys? Absolutely. Please. Okay. Well, thanks, Sean. I'm glad I was able to make this call, um, yeah. and uh, to everyone who's participating. And I recognize a lot of uh, familiar names out there. You know, I I I've been you know obviously uh, people want to know you know look into the magic crystal ball and what is the indicator that tells us 
are we going to go into a recession or are we going to go start seeing a sort of growth again? Um, and, you know, don't forget that, you know, all the pundits and all the papers uh, when are, are not very creative when it comes to reporting. So when they see markets going down, generally speaking, it's going to get worse. And when they see markets going up, generally speaking, they say it's going to get better. I think the real acid test in this situation is the unemployment rates in our respective countries. And if we, you know, if there's one indicator, it's not going to be oil anymore. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be uh, the unemployment rate. You know, keep in mind that no government wants to create a recession. They just want to get the free cash that's out there and the employment levels that are out there back in, in balance. And so they've, they've been actually quite cautious and the unemployment rate really hasn't gone up by any significant margin, or at least the way it's been reported. So that gives me a lot of comfort in 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 feeling that they're managing this in in, in a most appropriate way in this cycle. Yeah, you're quite right, Jeff. Employment has not been. Employment numbers are strong both sides of the border very strong and one of the one of the concerns this sounds almost counterintuitive um but one of the reasons we think inflation is going to stick around longer than people think is because there's been no job loss and people are still out there spending a lot of money and in some contract negotiations right now where you're negotiating let's say three-year labor contracts it's not like, okay, you get 1.8% this year, 1.9% the next year, and 2% the next year. It's 5% this year, 45 the next, and 45 the next. So a lot of the inflation is not the goods inflation that got all the headline news early on where we had supply chain issues. A lot of the inflation right now, 75% of the inflation numbers right now, our service inflation, our wage inflation. But yeah, it's, there's not just one number to look at. And Jeff brings up a good point. You have to look at, you know, any number of different measures and, and employment certainly one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're right, uh, Sean. Uh, you know, the real goal of this was to try to nip wage inflation in the bud, uh, you know, especially with with the constricted supply chains that we've had, and and that's really what they've had to what they've tried to do. So yes, there is going to be some, and you're seeing now you're seeing strikes uh, uh, in various sectors, and they're really trying to hold that hold that wage inflation down so we don't get this what they call this inflationary spiral. Um, you know, it remains to be seen, but I, I have every confidence that the managers that we've got in place are ahead of the so far ahead of the curve on on their on their buys and their holds. Uh, and that's part of the reason that we work with with Fidelity and and their team because they are incredibly progressive and incredibly uh, uh, protective of our of our assets. Per, I see there's a question here. If you don't mind, uh, yeah, I'm gonna question. I'm gonna give it to you now. And actually, what uh, what uh, Jeff just said about you guys being protective about our assets actually leads well into that. Um, so for someone that has a uh, has on that on an ongoing basis had a conservative approach. Uh, this is this is from Andrew. Uh, what sector would be a good higher risk hedge to offset that cons conservative approach? I guess, or maybe complement it. So if if I'm generally conservative, but I want to take to have a little bit of money, I want to take a little bit of risk with. What what would I do? Um, do you want over to me, or did you want to? So uh, I'm gonna leave the chance again. There's a yeah, couple of ways you can attack that. Fidelity, yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of ways you can attack that. So, you know, if the starting place is 60 equity, 40 fixed income, if only because that's where a lot of institutional money sits at and we need to have an arbitrary starting place. And so if you're at 60% equity, but, you know, this individual says if you're slightly more conservative, so let's say you're 50 equity or 40 equity, um, we would say that's prudent right now, but if you wanted on the fringes to take more risk, then you could take it up 10% into equities. But I think the question wanted more than that, it wanted sector. So what sector typically leads out? And that, it, it's interesting. We had, uh, we had an internal discussion on this. Different sectors lead out all the time from different recessions. 
depending on where we're at in a cycle. So, you know, COVID was, you know, we had a very sharp drop, but the markets were back within five to six weeks. And obviously technology led the led back out of that market drop because we're all working from home, right? Because we're all working from home. So those two things kind of meshed at that, at that point. But if we, you know, if in, inflation's sticky and we have a recession and you want to have more risk coming out of that, maybe if, if inflation's sticky, it might be commodities. So different sectors can lead coming out of coming out of a recession or difference, you know, what I, my advice, even as a Fidelity employee, is I don't try and pick the sector. I try and pick managers, portfolio managers who are picking those sectors for me, who I know might be slightly more aggressive uh, manager than someone else at Fidelity. Because I you know we definitely, you know, there's a spectrum of value managers who are pretty defensive, uh, you know, we had one defensive manager who was actually up last year in markets that were, were just terrible. And then we have more aggressive managers. So I said, give the money to a slightly more aggressive manager and let he or she pick the, the sectors they think are going to lead given where the economy is at. I hope that answers the question. And John, I mean, you touched on a few good points and maybe we can delve into that a little bit further. So can you, I, I, I presume that you're speaking with or hearing with some of the managers um, on a monthly or weekly basis. Can you maybe shed light on, Sammy, I mean, we talked about growth versus value. One of the names in growth that, that uh, our team is, has uh, come to use a lot in our portfolios is uh, Mark Schmel, who manages the Fidelity Global Innovators portfolio, special situations, and I believe Canadian growth. Uh, can you maybe share some parallels as to what you're hearing from, from Mark on the technology side and maybe versus uh, what you're hearing say on the value side, maybe a Don Newman or somebody in that vein who manages uh, the dividend side of things. Can you maybe share some thoughts as to what yeah. the portfolio managers are saying? Yeah, great, great um, segue. So on, on the grow side, like towards Mark Schmale, and Mark is seen as probably a preeminent growth manager in Canada. What's, what's interesting about Mark is he will gravitate back to value for brief periods of time as he will say, to live another day. So when things were getting really bad, you know, let's say in his top 10 names, if, if the economy is really strong, his top 10 holdings might be all growth holdings, all technology names. But there's one point last year when things were looking really bad, I think he was down to two of his top 10 for growth names or more value. So he will swing. Right now he's swung back. Uh, I would say he's one of our more bullish managers at, at uh, Fidelity right now. He's added some growth back. But what we used to think of growth names now um, might not be what he would consider growth, but a lot of the tech firms right now you'll see are laying people off, all right? And, and as Mark will say, like name the, name the big tech firm. It could be Salesforce or Meta, which used to be Facebook. You name the tech firm, everybody would have 100 projects going on, hoping 10 hit. Well, that was easy to do when money was cheap and interest rates were low. Now you really got to try and pick out of the 100 projects you're, you're working on, what are the 10 or 15 projects that might have the most impact? And so we're going to get rid of these other people, right? And that's kind of what happened is happening in Silicon Valley. You see in Toronto, how many people, you know, in Ontario, Shopify have let off and a few of the tech firms, um, some tech firms that were taking space downtown have now not taken it because they're not adding employees. Um, so a lot of these, even, even three or four years ago, tech firms that were high flyers are now getting pops in their stock when they announce some layoffs because that's just gonna help the bottom line. Their wage, wage is, you know, you save X amount in wages, that goes right to the profitability of the firm. And some of them are coming quite uh, artful at it in that, um, they'll do a few rounds of layoffs. So what do I mean by that? So instead of laying off 30,000 people, uh, they might do three tranches of 10,000 because they get a little pop in the stock every time. So, but I would say in general, Mark is more tilted towards the growth side right now. And over on the Don Newman, um, Dan DuPont side, you know, they, they will say, especially Dan, um, 
Don's a dividend investor. So if you have inflation, uh, let's say running four or five percent, you can clip a four or five percent dividend to cover inflation plus a little growth. You know, dividends are a great place to look right now. Don would be more in the middle, slightly towards value. And then on the value side would be Dan DuPont and in Dan's view, and he is the most uh, conservative investor we have. Uh, hey, this, this pricing bubble in equities built up over 15, 20 years, you don't fix it in 12 months like we did last year. And if you look, the market's kind of been range bound since June of last year. Like we're almost 12 months into a range bound market. Right. So that's and that's one of the strengths of us, you know, at, at Fidelity, we've got differing views. All of our managers are paid to have their own views and that's the way they're compensated. So they aren't, we don't tell them, hey, you have to think X. You you can have your own thoughts. And by the way, if you're right, we pay you well. And if you're wrong, we don't pay you so well. Right. And that's they're, they're based on performance. And um you know, most of them grew up at Fidelity together and they can have very differing views. And that's why owning them together, like, you know, they joke, Mark and, and Dan grew up together at Fidelity, but they're as different as night and day. But if you own 50% of one and 50% of the other for, you know, a 20 year cycle, you're probably gonna do fantastic, but you're always gonna be uh, tempted to sell one just at the wrong time because they kind of move, right? If you have a portfolio where everything's working, all at the same time, your portfolio is not built very well. It's not well diversified. Anything else, gang? I had one other note here on fixed income. Um, you know, and I love these statistics. I'm not a stats guy, but I love the statistics. Fixed income had its worst year, arguably, in history last year. That's what hurt bond funds. That's what hurt some balance funds. But as we headed into this calendar year, our fixed income team sees a 50% chance of a double-digit return in fixed income uh, and only a 10% chance of a fixed income loss in 2023. Okay, so if I just repeated that, a 50% chance of a double digit return on fixed income in 2023 and a 10% chance of a loss in 2023. So that makes it pretty compelling. You know, I go back to that question we had earlier, you know, if we we're doing this, uh, if we we're doing this webinar on July 1st, my advice might be to somebody, Hey, if you're using it 60% uh, equities, maybe back that off to 50 or 40 because the numbers on the fixed income side have become so attractive. But I uh, and just on that uh, note, that's not always something that we need to do as uh, an individual investor because uh, Jeff, Eric, and I will make suggestions on that. And on top of that, the managers in the balance fund, similar to that positioning chart you had, will help you with that. So if you, can you throw that up again, Sean? Absolutely. Great call on that. And you're exactly right, Pear. So, you know, so, so, as opposed to, so as opposed to my namesake, Homer Simpson, who sits at the nuclear plant and has one button to press the whole time to make sure the plant doesn't blow up, these managers have a few more buttons that they can press or levers that they can pull. Um, they can pull, you know, the, the uh, Canada, US, international equity lever, and they can, and they don't just have you know, gas or not gas, they can they can go faster on com commodity, slower on Canadian equities. They can increase credit uh, risk or inflation protection as they think there's opportunity there. And so right now you can see they're pretty balanced here, but maybe half a year from now or in well, half a year, uh, three, a quarter from now in July, this might be different. So they change this on a regular basis and that's, they're doing that on our, our behalf. And so part of it is not just picking as managers or as um, advisors, what sector we like the best, but what what managers do we most trust to manage this for us? And so do we believe that, you know, David Wolf, David Tulk and Elon Collette know what they're doing, for example, in the Global Balanced Fund or the Canadian Balanced Fund? And do they know what they're doing in terms of pulling these levers? And of course, you know, our answer is yes. So yeah. that's, that's well, it. and that's a great point. Like without you guys even picking up the phone, and calling your clients, and I've circled the equities down there on the bottom uh, left. 
uh, this would have, our portfolio managers would have moved this five or 6% in the last kind of six or seven months on behalf of advisors like yourself and investors. So we're doing that on your behalf and on your client's behalf um, without even making the phone call. And that's kind of what's one, one great thing about the product because it's done underneath the hood. Another thing that investors on a different topic will come and often our clients will often ask about, and this makes a lot of sense, is when when do the crack geniuses at Fidelity think that the Bank of Canada is going to start cutting rates? Are they done hiking rates, number one? And are they going to start cutting rates anytime in the near, next 10 years? Yeah, uh, I think 10 years, that's great. Um, we don't think rate cuts are coming anytime soon. We don't. Um, you know, even Chairman Powell got a little on the Fed side, you know, last week, you know, he said, you know, I, I don't think we're going to have to raise rates again, but we're not cutting. We're certainly not cutting. And if we have to raise rates again, we will. Right. So um, until we and inflation will continue to come down, but we think it's going to get to a level for a while here. Let's say. You know, 4% is certainly better than, you know, where we topped out at, you know, around eight. Um, 4% is way better. But 4% is still 100% higher than 2%, which is the goal. Right? So the market has priced in rate cuts. Um, sorry, the, the stock market has priced in rate cuts. And we're like... It might take a little longer to get those than people think. Sean, you mentioned the stock market pricing in. Uh, what about that that looming idea of recession? Is that something that uh, managers or or is felt is is being reflected in there, or is the water still a little too murky to uh, to predict? Uh, uh, great question. It's a mix. So we think that. Um, a recession is priced in the market, but we also think there's other people pricing in on the upside, or, or sorry, think that rates are, um, sorry, are too aggressive on their earnings assumptions. Okay. So some people, things that may or may not be wrong when it comes, or sorry, may or may not be right when it comes to market assumptions. Some people think there's, there's going to be rate hikes, right? Those would be glass half, and glass half full optimists, right? Rates are going to get cut. It's going to help stock markets. Um, but you might also have some people in there that think, geez, earnings projections are a little slightly overly aggressive right now. Profits, in our view, right? We think consensus estimates need to come back just a little bit. Um, and we also think people are expecting rate cuts a little quicker than we think. And then kind of add, what, yeah, what about valuations? What, what is the, the sentiment regarding valuations, say, on the, the U.S. side, Canadian side? Uh, anything to add on, on that front, just to see where we are at or what you're hearing? Valuations are fair if the earning estimates are right. Valuations are a little full if earning estimates are, are a little high. So not... Nothing on sale, particularly. Things seem to be somewhat in balance from what we're... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think I think it's really important to note that, you know, on, on, on a balanced portfolio, if you're... What are we running around? 4% now year to date? Yep. So uh, that's for the first third of the year. Uh, that's all your growth on a GIC if you owned one. Uh, for the whole year. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we've always preached uh, longer term, you know, we're not looking at uh, spending this money all in one year. We know that over time, and that's the, the three to five year window, our returns will, will, will stabilize and be, be excellent. The cost of not being properly invested during these uh, tumultuous times uh, is, is higher than the cost of staying invested. So, um, and and in staying invested, I mean, with with people who are looking at the holdings in a critical way, which is what we do. So so I think you know th that that philosophy has done us well. 
Jeff, you, you bring up a great point. Like sometimes I just like to go back to some, uh, you know, investment basics here. And, you know, if you look at a time period here of, you know, almost 40 years, um, you know, if you just miss out on the 10 best days out of 40 years, not 10 best years, not 10 best months, 10 best days, look at how much growth, like timing, it's, it's not market timing, it's time in the market, yep. right? We get rewarded for patience, right? And these are just days here, like it's an yep. unbelievable slide. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, that's that's good. Excellent. I think. I mean, we hit uh, we hit a lot of the the big fundamental. I mean, we touched on inflation, unemployment. Uh, we looked at interest rates. Those are the big questions that that we often get our way. Uh, there's one. I mean, I don't know if you wanted to share anything on crypto. That one's uh, it was pre more prevalent last year. I don't know if if Sean, you had anything to. Uh, to share on that front or any thoughts uh, if not we can we can skip but that's uh... you know, i'll give you a quick like one minute uh you know bargains crypto is a bargain right i think crypto is one of the best performing asset classes year to date if not the best performing but outside of that long term we think crypto is um going to be part of our economy right there's going to be bumps and bruises along the way uh, I would say to individuals, do not, you know, I don't own any crypto myself. I let managers get in and out of crypto as they see fit. Um, Fidelity as an organization is one of the uh, top custodians of crypto globally. Um, and we've invested a lot in it, but I'm not going to go out personally and buy crypto because I don't know enough about it. And if you own crypto and, you know, you keep it on your encryption key, encryption key on your phone, um, sell it and get it some cold storage instead of the hot storage. Um, so buy the ETF or something of, of that nature, because, you know, people lose a, a lot of money by losing their encryption key. They, the, the best thing about crypto and no, no way. Uh disrespect to any of the managers who bought it is that it's a wonderful solution to a problem nobody has. Um, however, um, you know, when it's, it stops ceasing, it stops trading as, as a speculative uh, commodity and starts trading as a currency, I think then, then, uh, you know, it's worthwhile giving it a fair look, but, but as it stands now, whether it's crypto or tulips, um, you know, you take your, you takes your chances. Yeah, the crypto, you know, the idea of carrying crypto on a USB key and all this stuff. I mean, it's all interesting and technically maybe intellectually stimulating. But if I gave you, Sean, a $10,000 bill, right, or $10,000 in cash, would you walk around with that in your briefcase? No, exactly. Right? You don't want to go put it somewhere, study yeah. it somewhere safe. Maybe, you know, at a bank in a safety deposit box, somewhere where, you know, you know that you're not going to forget it at the library, right? Absolutely, pair. So, so, uh, so that's where, you know, if we don't, we don't tend to deal a lot in crypto on, on our team between Jeff, Eric, and I. But, um, you know, if someone did want to buy it, you know, that's where I would say probably. You know, one of the ETFs that deal with crypto is probably the best way to do it because you can get your money back almost the next day. Yeah, and you, well, know, you know where your money is. So. Yeah, I agree 100%. But again, I like, I always like Jeff's line. It's the solution to a problem that didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> so. In fact, in some countries, it does have merit. Uh, you know, you know, in Haiti right now, <clears throat> You might be better off with crypto than with the whatever currency they use in that country. But um, anyway, that's a, that's a whole that's a something a subject for another uh, lunchtime debate. Yeah, the final, a very interesting yeah. webinar on monetary systems across the world. Uh, Zimbabwe is a very there was an interesting article on Apple News over the weekend about them. So. Oh.
There is a question, I think, uh, from uh, about gold, uh, Haim, uh, uh, Pear. Did you see that one? Yo, there's one there uh, from a, a guy I happen to know well, very well. Uh, yeah. Chuck. Uh, yeah. Chuck has a question. Uh, what's the recommended role for, for gold? Uh, the short answer is it falls under the commodities bucket in, in that positioning slide, but uh, I'll let Sean give the long answer. No, that, that's bang on, Pear. If you think inflation is going to be sticky, you want to own a little gold. Long-term, gold is not a productive asset. Um, but in times, so uh, it's not going to, you know, typically gold goes up at the rate of inflation long-term. Um, so there's better asset classes to own, unless you think inflation is going to be an issue, and in which case you want to own gold. And we at Fidelity would be in that bucket right, right now, or in that time frame. Hmm. Interesting. Do you know how much gold is in that commodity sleeve, roughly? Is it a... I don't know. There, or, there's a portion? Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 well, unfortunately, you're not going to get rich on gold anymore. Maybe back in the seventies when it was it was the crypto of of the of the crypto darling of the uh, investment world, uh, it 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 crashed and burned also though, so uh, it's not even that valuable as a as a, a a resource. I mean, unless you know, in India they're they're going on a buying spree for jewelry because I mean it's not used in electronics very much anymore. It's you know it's not you know it's not used in dental work i don't know where it's used anymore but it's just you know it's just not that valuable uh, uh, it's it's a metal that doesn't tarnish but it's not that valuable uh, in, in any of the manufacturing processes anyways we have to res respect the hour don't we you guys we do so i'll just i'll okay. i'll do a, a wrap up and then uh, maybe pair can send us some final words so i mean a few of the one big thanks to sean for uh, sharing uh, his thoughts today coming up some some great slides and hopefully putting some perspective to uh, to to what goes under the hood uh, on a daily basis. I mean, we get the question often, hey, with what's going on in the markets, what should we be doing with our investments? What should we be doing differently? One thing that we we often like to remind clients is uh, that we can rest assured is that we have two things at our disposal. One, we have a global management team, one at Fidelity and with other managers that we work with. Uh, that look at the allocation on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have one layer of security there. And two, we also have the underlying managers that are looking at each of their stocks, making decisions based on how things are going uh, on the market. So we have two, without making any active trades, we have two levels of security that are working together to keep your hard-earned uh, money and savings uh, well invested and diversified during these times. So something that we not often forget. So we like to, to bring this to the forefront. Uh, but big thank you to Sean. A few summary points uh, for me. I mean, staying liquid, we know the banks are aggressively pushing all the GIC sales and there's a flight to safety. Uh, but I think as Jeff pointed out today, you're in a global balanced portfolio. You've made 4% year to date and it's three months in. Uh, GICs, you're tying up your money for, for a whole year and you might get 4% and all of that is taxes, interest, income. So uh, you don't get to keep all that money. 100%. So, uh, big Fair reminder enough. there. And granted, if you do want to keep some cash liquid, but keep it invested, we have some great options. Uh, there's a, a high interest fund that we like to use. It's paying out just under four or 5% net interest, and it is not locked in. You get your money back in your bank account in two days. So a great option, one for staying liquid, but also uh, gathering up a little bit more interest than what your bank account or a high savings bank account would be paying out. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then Sean had a great point about dollar cost averaging. Uh, which essentially means buying into the market over time, something we preach to everybody. And especially at these times where the waters are a little bit choppier, outlook is good, but waters are choppier. It's something that we would certainly look to do. Uh, so the good thing is there's some optimism in the market, especially on the fixed income side. And it's something that that we look to as we review our portfolios, uh, make sure that we're actively rebalancing there. So a uh, great point in bringing that up, Sean. Uh, and then lastly, wanted to introduce uh, our newest team member, Anna Maria. And uh, you can see her here pictured uh, on our on our team sheet. Uh, so she just joined as of uh, two weeks ago and uh, very happy to uh, have Anna Maria joining our team. So she'll be sending out a little e-blast and a welcome soon, uh, but very excited and happy to have Anna Maria from our team. Uh, she's from Ukraine and uh, she's very excited to, uh, to work and uh, join our team. So thank you to Anna Maria. Thank you to everybody for taking part.
And with that, we will uh, wish everybody a great day. If you had any questions or you want to chat about anything that we discussed today, please feel free to reach out. You know how to get in touch with us. And once again, thank you to Sean. Thank you, Fidelity, for uh, the, the support and the great work that uh, you and the team does. And a uh, reminder, everybody, get your taxes done before the deadline. And uh, then you can enjoy the nice weather coming up in May. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Sean, again, for your wisdom and expertise. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, taking the time to chat with us. Uh, we always think, oh, we're going to keep it short and 30 minutes and so forth. And then, of course, Sean says a bunch of interesting stuff. And now it's we're at 52 minutes. So uh, thanks for having me, Gary. Can't, can't okay, complain uh, about that. And, and uh, thank you to uh, Leah for organizing this as well. And, um, you know, any questions, just reach out to us. And, and thank you, Craig, for your kind words about, uh, about the webinar. We, we enjoyed it as well. OK, see everybody. All right. Have a great rest of your week, everybody.